This video was recorded live with active participation from class attendees. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask in the comments or send a direct message. Thank you and enjoy the video. Let's get things started. No wasting of time here. Uh, tonight our topic is going to be on burns. So hello and welcome. EMS is a lot of hands-on stuff, right? So it's really difficult for me to talk you through how to place a traction splint on a patient just by lecture. You actually need to do it too. So I don't want you to get all your credits just from this. I do want you to still do some in-person training as well, because like I said, it's it's hard to actually, you know, learn how to do things via lecture. You actually have to put your hands on it and do it. So, all right, but let's get into the topic of burns, okay? So starting out, uh, the skin is the largest organ of the body, and it's the body's first line of defense against any external forces and infection. It's relatively tough, but it's still very susceptible to injury. Injuries to the skin uh, may expose blood vessels, nerves, and bones. In all instances, we as EMTs uh, must control bleeding. We need to prevent further contamination to decrease the risk of infection. Uh, and we need to protect wounds from further damage. So applying dressing and bandages to various parts of the patient's body is going to be something that we need to do as well. And again, learning that via lecture is pretty difficult, okay? So hence in-class in training is important too. So my internet just said it's unstable. Can you guys still hear me okay? Yeah, you dropped out for a few seconds earlier there, but then you came back. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. I hope that doesn't happen again. Hello, Pamela. I see you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Oh, and someone's coming driving from Crystal Falls. Heather. Okay. No problem, Heather. Thanks for joining us. So... Okay, our skin, it varies in thickness. In our very young or our very old population, you will notice that they have thinner skin. And also looking at the body, you will see that the eyelids, your lips, and your ears have real thin skin as well. But if you look at the scalp or our back or the soles of our feet, you will see that it is much thicker. Uh, the skin has two principal layers, which are the epidermis and the dermis. So the epidermis is the tough external layer that forms a watertight covering for the body, and it is composed of several layers. So the layers of the epidermis include the, and I don't know if I'm going to say these all correctly, so forgive me, but include the stratum basal or basale which this is the deepest portion of the epidermis. You have the stratum spinosum, the stratum granulosum, the stratum lucidum, and stratum corneum, which is the most superficial portion of the epidermis. And now the dermis is the inner layer of the skin. So here you're going to find where the hair follicles are, your sweat glands, and the sebaceous glands. Uh, there are blood vessels in the dermis, and they provide the skin with all of its nutrients and oxygen. Uh, there are also various openings in the body that are lined with mucous membranes. Uh, these mucous membranes provide a protective barrier against any bacterial invasion uh, it, to be able to come into the body. And here you see a picture uh, showing you the layers of the skin. And you can also see it's showing you the subcutaneous tissue and there that houses the fat and the muscle. That's the next layer down. So our skin serves many functions. It is a barrier against infection, like I said. It's also a sensory organ, so it's gonna feel um, hot, it's gonna feel cold things, it'll feel, um, if there's any pain, it will feel that. If It helps the body regulate temperature as well, and it also helps maintain fluid balance. So any break in the skin could allow bacteria to enter and then increases the possibility of infection or increases the possibility of fluid loss or blood loss, uh, loss of temperature control. Uh, and all of these things we will discuss uh, further along uh, in these slides here. So 
Uh, there are three types of soft tissue injury. There's closed injuries, open injuries, and then there are burns. <clears throat> so burns are among the most serious and painful of all the soft tissue injuries. The burn occurs when the body or a body part receives more radiant energy than it can absorb, and which then results in an injury. Some sources of this energy can be radiant heat. So for instance, the sun or standing next to a fire. Uh, you could have convection heat, which is the process of heat transfer by bulk movement of molecules within fluids such as gases and liquids. Uh, conduction heat, and this is where the heat travels through an object and you come in contact with it. So if I'm boiling a pot of water on the stove and then I touch the pot without a pot holder, I may get burnt. So you may also get burns by toxic chemicals. So think of your sulfuric acids or any acids really. Uh, drain cleaners, paint thinners, gasolines can all produce a burn. Uh, electricity, so electrical burns, arc burns, and thermal contact burns, uh, lightning. Or for instance, bring it back to the EMS field, um, you place the defibrillation pads on your patient and you zap them, right? You could potentially see some burn marks on that chest. So although a burn can be uh, maybe the patient's most obvious injury, you should still always perform a complete assessment to determine whether other serious injuries are present as well. So. You'll also want to watch for shock in children, your older patients, and patients who have chronic illnesses. They are more likely to have shock from burns than in the other populations, but that does not exclude the other populations from going into shock, okay? But if you're, again, your population, children, the older patients, and people who have like, you know, multiple um, uh, illnesses, you want to definitely watch for shock in them. So smoking and open flame are actually the leading cause of burn injury for older adults. And scalding is the leading cause of burn injury for children. So who has seen this elderly man on our left side, right? He's smoking a cigarette and he's uh, on oxygen. I'm sure that we have all seen this at some time or another. So I actually got to witness a man's face get burned during a party. He was smoking and he thought it would be kind of funny to show the kids how flammable oxygen was. Uh, but the nasal cannula was still attached to his face. Uh, so <laughs> um, he, you know, he actually lit his face on fire from from doing that. Uh, it was put out and he wasn't hurt, but there was potential there. Um, and then, of course, with your kiddos, you can see how easily it would be for them to get a scald burn. They're always wanting to do what mom and dad are doing, right? So they're, you know, we're messing on the stove and then that child, we walk away, that child comes through and grabs that handle and potentially gets scalded. All right, let's talk a little bit about pathophysiology of a burn. So the pathophysiology of the burn is characterized by an inflammatory reaction, which leads to rapid edema formation or swelling, and it increases permeability and vasodilation of vessels. The earliest stage of vasodilation and increased venous permeability is commonly due to what we call a histamine reaction or a histamine release. Most all burns, you are going to see this, okay? So depending on how severe the burn is, you will go through more stages and because you can have increased pressure to the area, you could see a potential pH imbalance, uh, potentially decreased blood flow to the skin. And because we are trying to protect the vital organs, um, there's gonna be decreased blood flow to the kidneys and then the GI tract. You see how we're kind of going down the rabbit hole here? Uh, initially, the body will compensate with increased peripheral vascular resistance, but then you will start seeing decreased uh, cardiac output in the patient, um, and then a decrease of oxygen heading to our tissues and to the vital organs as well. And then lastly, death will occur from a burn. So all of this, of course, is going to depend upon the depth of the burn, the duration, uh, and temperature of the burn. So burn injuries are progressive. So the greater the heat energy, the deeper the wound is going to be. So three zones of injury. 
So the current understanding of burn wounds includes three zones. So they are the zone of coagulation, zone of stasis, and zone of hyperemia. So the central area, so as you're looking at this picture, <clears throat> the central area with the most intense heat contact and the most damage is called the zone of coagulation. So if this zone penetrates the dermis, right, that's so you have the epidermis and then the dermis, as you can see in that picture, um, it's going to result in uh, a burn that's classified as full thickness. Uh, the area of the burn extending peripherally, so surrounding that from the zone of coagulation, is could become inflamed. And then you're going to see a decrease in blood flow to that area. Your zone of stasis. The surrounding zone of stasis is characterized by decreased tissue perfusion. The tissue in this zone is can be potentially salvageable. All right. And then you also have the zone of hyperemia. So this outermost zone tissue perfusion can be increased. The tissue has uh, will invariably recover unless there is a potential of severe sepsis or even prolonged hypoperfusion or prolonged shock. So these three zones of a burn, they are three-dimensional, and loss of tissue in the zone of stasis will lead to the wound being able to deepen and um, widen as well. So the injury will become larger. Here you see some complications of burns. So again, that skin serves as a barrier between the environment and the body. So when a person is burned, that barrier is destroyed. So you're going to have that high risk again for infection, for hypothermia, for hypovolemia, and for shock. Burns to the airway are of significant importance because the loose mucosa in the hypopharynx can swell and lead to a complete airway obstruction. So those two pictures on the left there you see is a swelling of your airway. Okay, that is what you're looking at there. Pretty difficult to get some oxygen through that. Do you all agree? So that is, um, that right there is a severe burn and potentially life-threatening. So circumferential burns of the chest, so that's when the burn is completely um, through, through the chest and around to the back, can compromise your breathing. So because the person now can't take in some really good breaths, okay? So it compromises their breathing. And you can see some circumferential burns of an extremity, which can lead to compartment syndrome. Uh, and I know that uh, Emma had an opportunity to actually see something like that uh, on our last burn victim that we had had. Um, so uh, compartment syndrome is going to result in neurovascular compromise and irreversible damage if it's not treated appropriately. Uh, these folks are going to need an escarotomy, which is a surgical procedure, procedure used to treat full thickness or a third degree circumferential burn. Um, and that is what you're actually looking at in that third picture, is a circumferential burn of the left leg. Okay. Uh, this gentleman underwent an escharotomy to alleviate the swelling to the extremity, and it was uh, he was able to have access to blood flow again, that leg was. Uh, and of course, the escharotomy is where a surgeon will actually make an incision through the eschar or the burnt part of the, the area to release the pressure. So... Uh, and obviously, if you suspect any complications, you are going to uh, ask for ALS backup if you are a BLS squad. Okay. <clears throat> so five factors to help determine the severity of a burn. So the two factors are the most important. So what is the depth of the burn? What is the extent of the burn? Are there any critical areas that are involved, which like your face, the upper airway, hands, feet, and the genital area? Does the patient have any pre-existing medical conditions or other injuries? Is the patient younger than five or older than 55? Now, burns to the face area are of particular importance, again, due to the potential of airway involvement. 
And then burns to the hands or feet or over joints are considered serious because of the potential for loss of function as a result of scarring. So let's talk depth of burn. So your superficial or your first degree burns, these are going to involve the top layer of the skin, which is our epidermis. Uh, you're going to see the skin is going to be red. There's not going to be blisters um, on this at this uh, degree. At the first degree, we do not see blisters yet. The burn site is often very painful. So an, exa a, an example would be a sunburn, okay? Your partial thickness or a second degree burn is going to involve the epidermis and some portion of the dermis. So these burns do not destroy the entire thickness of the skin um, and it does not um, destroy any of the subcutaneous tissue underneath either. So typically you're gonna see that the skin is moist. It could be mottled, white to red skin coloring and you will, pro you will see blisters in, at this stage. And uh, these patients will have intense pain. And then lastly, your full thickness or your third degree burn. So these, this burn is going to extend through all skin layers. It can involve subcutaneous layers. It can involve muscles, even bones, all the way even to potentially internal organs. Okay. Uh, the burned area is going to look appear uh, dry and leathery. It can appear white, real dark brown, or even charred, okay? If the nerve endings have been destroyed, a severely burned uh, patient may not have any feeling to that area where there's the third degree and, uh, and uh, the nerve endings being burnt as well, okay? So, but they are still going to have significant pain to the surrounding areas. Uh, most likely if they have third degree burns, they're also gonna have second and first degree burns. And remember those burns are pretty painful, okay? Um, so the surrounding, uh, let's say, okay. So significant airway burns are serious. Again, we talked about that, right? So we could potentially see uh, singed hair within the nostrils. Maybe you see some soot around the nose and the mouth. When they're talking, they talk real, have that hoarse voice. They're real hoarse, have hoarseness. Uh, maybe they're hypoxic as well, okay? Their oxygen saturations are lower. So these patients need to be rapidly transported to an emergency department. Um, they need to have an advanced airway controlled quickly. So here are some pictures um, from superficial first degree all the way to third degree. Uh, your first degree, again, is that sunburn, which is uh, picture A. Your second degree, you see some blistering going on there. So that is your um, picture B. And then your picture C is the third degree or full thickness burns. And up on the top as well, you can see kind of how it's going through the, the epidermis and then the epidermis and the dermis, and then it's full thickness. Okay. <clears throat> so we talked a little bit about this, but I'm just going to kind of reiterate just some of the things here. So those full thickness burns that involve hand, feet, face, airway, or the genitals. Um, again, these areas are prone to greater infection. Uh, our, think about, you know, our hands, it touches everything, right? Everything to, you know, eating to, you know, dirt, whatever, you know, um, we're touching everything with our hands. Same with our feet, we're putting them on, you know, we're walking on them. Uh, the genital area, obviously, this is where we eliminate our fecal matter and our urine. So if we have in, uh, burn down there, and now we're excreting these, you know, this toxin from our body, it, you know, we could potentially uh, get some in crazy infections down there, right? So, all right, so full thickness burns covering more than 10% of the body's total surface area, okay? This is a severe burn. Even though it's only 10%, right? It's a full thickness burn. This is constituted as a severe burn. 
uh, your partial thickness burns that cover more than 30% of the body surface area is a, um, is a severe burn. Any burns involving the respiratory tract. So think of smoke inhalation. Um, you know, again, you could have that potential of a closed or swollen airway, which could be disastrous for that patient. Another severe burn would be a burn that's also complicated by some broken bones. Uh, again, your burns that have uh, your patients younger than five or your patients older than 55. So that would otherwise be classified as moderate burns on younger adults. Okay, so if, for instance, for, you know, Journey's age, a younger adult, she may present as a moderate burn, but if you're five or younger, 55 or older, that's going to be a severe burn for them. <clears throat> All right, so there are a few ways we can estimate the extent of a burn. So first one is we can use the rule of palm. So, and that's palm, P-A-L-M, palm. So this estimates the surface area that has been burned by comparing it to the size of the patient's palm, not your palm, the patient's palm. So, which is e roughly equal to 1% of the patient's total body surface area. Okay, so that's this area right here on the patient, all right, 1%, okay? There's also the rule of nines which estimates the extent of a burn by dividing the body into sections and each representing approximately 9% of the total body surface area. So if we look at this picture, you can see that the proportions differ for infants, children, and adults, right? The head, legs, the head um, and the legs have different percentages. So you can note that the entire leg of the adult states it's 18. So if only the front is burnt, that's going to be only 9% of his leg that is burned, okay? Same with the arms and the head. So the same for the child and the infant. The numbers you are seeing are for the entirety of that area. So keep that in mind when making your burn calculation, okay? Uh, I also want to, again, point out when I had said that, you know, some of the proportions are a little bit different. If you look at the infant, the infant's leg is showing 13.5. The child's leg is showing 16.5. And then, of course, the adult leg is showing 18. All right. So, and we need to calculate the burn according to their size. Now, when you calculate the extent of a burn injury, we're only going to include the partial and full thickness burns. So your second and third degree burns, okay? We're gonna still document superficial burns or the first degree burns, but we're not actually gonna include them in the body surface area, ex estimation of the extent of the burn injury, okay? Okay, so let's do some quick math. See how well you guys do here. You have a one-year-old child with a second degree burn to the entire front and back of the thorax and the entire left leg. What percent is burnt? So do your calculation and you can either write it in the chat or unmute yourself and give us the answer. So you're looking at the infant here. Pretty one and a okay. half. So I see Anna said um, 49.5. Who spoke up? I'm... I did. And what did, what did you 30. say, Rand? You well, said yeah, 31 and a half. 31 and a half? Is okay. a one-year-old considered an infant or a child? So we're looking at the baby all the way to the left. Yeah. So that's 18. So the entire front and back. So now if you're looking at this as well, so you have 18 for the front and 18 for the back. 
Oh, I thought it was 18 for the front and back. No, 18 is the front and eight, and also 18 for the back. So Changes that on the legs mass, is a 13 it? and a half for the front? The yeah. entire left leg. So no, so the leg is okay. 13 and a half total. So if you can kind of see in the picture where it says back 18, I don't know if you, if you can see that. Okay. But it's showing that the front is 18 and then the back is 18 as well. Yeah. So we have 18 to the front, 18 to the back, and then the entire left leg. So now what's your answer? 49 and a half. 49, 49 and a half. half. Perfect. Good. Good, good. Okay, let's go to the second one. An adult with third degree burns to both front and back of legs. So legs as in plural. Uh, the front thorax and the front of bilateral arms. So both arms, but just the front of them. Sixty-three. Rand gets sixty-three. Do you guys agree? Wait, both, both arms. No, no, no. Sixty-three. Yeah, sixty-three. Sixty-three. Yeah. Okay, and I heard a yep for confirmation. Sixty-three is correct. Yes. So Anna, you said 58.5, I'm thinking you, so if we, oh, whoops, she says, okay, I think she caught her mistake. All right, so it is 63, good. All right, our third one, eight-year-old child, so our middle child here, with second degree burns to the back of his head, third degree burns to the front of the left arm and the entire front of the chest. So if our head is in totality 12, we just have the back, right? So we're going to divide that in half. 28 and a half. You grand to get 28 and a half. Okay, Samantha yeah. says 28 and a half. Do yeah. all of the Zoom folk land out there agree? 28.5. And we all said, yes, yes, 28.5 is correct. All right, good. Okay, let's move on. Pam, 28.5, yeah, perfect. Anna, good. Okay, so scene size up. So we need to ensure that the factors that led to the patient's burn injury no longer poses a hazard to yourself or your career crew or any other bystanders that could be potentially be in the area. Uh, the mechanism of injury. So we want to attempt to determine the type of burn that has been sustained um, along with the mechanism of injury. So what does the patient report? is going to often provide important information about the extent of their injury. So we want to also assess the scene for any environmental hazards. We want to know how many patients we have. Uh, call for additional resources early. Remember, you can always turn them around if you no longer need them. Uh, and you want to consider the potential for a spinal injury as well. So broken bones, you also want to look for, you want to look for if there's inhalation injuries and or any other injuries. Again, we can't kind of get tunnel visioned into a burn. We need to make, you know, make sure that we are assessing the whole situation, the whole patient, um, and uh, making sure that we're providing protection for, for everything in its totality. So we're gonna begin with a rapid exam. So this should take no longer than 90 seconds to perform. You then want to form your general impressions. So you're gonna look for clues to determine the severity of injuries and um, determine if there's a need for rapid tre treatment. Uh, you wanna be suspicious of clues that may indicate abuse as well. Uh, so if you're looking at a child 
for instance, and the child has burns to the buttocks, the hands, and the feet, but the rest of the, you know, the thorax is okay, the, maybe the knees are okay, right? So it could potentially look like this child has been placed sitting in a scalding water uh, bathtub or something, okay? So you want to be suspicious of that potentially. And of course, it's not just for infants. It could be elderly abuse as well. So keep a close eye on that. Uh, again, you want to consider the potential of uh, needing to stabilize the spine. Uh, check for responsiveness. So you're going to be using the ABPU scale, alert, verbal, painful, or unresponsive. In all of our patients whose level of consciousness is less than alert and oriented times four or that GCS of 15, we are going to want to give them some oxygen, okay? And we're going to want to provide immediate transport. So our airway and breathing, we want to be alert to any signs that the patient has potentially inhaled hot gases or maybe even really hot vapors. So again, looking for singed facial hair, looking for that soot that could be around their, uh, their airway. If your patient has heavy secretions and they're coughing frequently, could potentially could also indicate a respiratory burn. So you move on to your circulation. So are they bleeding? And if they are, we want to control if it's significant bleeding, right? We want to control that. Does our patient have any obvious life-threatening external hemorrhage? Um, if they do, we're going to control that bleeding even before we work on airway and breathing. Because if that person loses their whole blood supply, it doesn't matter if they're breathing or they're not going to be for long, right? So we need to make sure that we, um, we are able to uh, handle that first. We're gonna treat shock in burn patients by preventing heat loss. So we're gonna to wanna to cover them up with a blanket. We're gonna get into that patient compartment and turn that temperature up in the ambulance to keep them nice and warm. Um, our transport decision. So we're going to consider rapid transport for a patient who has any airway problems, any breathing problems, uh, if they have significant burn injuries, um, maybe external bleeding potentially, uh, signs and symptoms of that internal bleeding. And again, if you're a BLS squad, you're going to want to get those ALS providers on their way to you. Okay, so history taking, again, investigate the chief complaint. Be alert for signs or symptoms of other injuries due to the mechanism of injury. If the patient was burned in a confined space, you do want to suspect an inhalation injury as well. When burns result from explosive forces, be alert for other internal injuries and fractures. You want to obtain a medical history and be alert for injury specific signs and symptoms and pertinent negatives. Okay, so along with the sample history, we're going to ask some of the following questions. Are you having any difficulty breathing? Are you having any difficulty swallowing? Do you are you experiencing any pain? Uh, you want to check whether the patient has an emergency medical identification device. And then, of course, you're going to ask the OPQRST questions as well. You want to do a thorough history for your patient. Your secondary assessment. So this is where we're doing a complete head to toe, right? Perform an exam of the entire body, assess the patient from head to toe, looking for D DCAP BTLS. And I'm betting you guys all remember what DCAP BTLS means. And I'll go through it real quick. Uh, deformities, contusion, abrasion, penetration, burns, tenderness, laceration, and swelling. You want to make a rough estimate using the rule of nines of the extent of the burned area. And again, that's for your second and third degree burns. Determine the classification of the burn, uh, the severity of the burn. You're going to want to now package the patient for transport. Get an early set of vital signs. So within the first five to 10 minutes of patient contact, you are going to want to get a really good set of vital signs because now we can see how well is this patient tolerating their injuries. Okay, are they becoming hypovolemic? We're gonna see a decrease in uh, blood pressure, maybe an increase in a heart rate. Okay, so getting that early set of vital signs will help give you a good um, track of where your patient is going and how well they're doing. Obviously we want an oxygen saturation uh, on our patients and if we can monitor their carbon monoxide as well. Um, if you have a tool for that, you'll want to use that as well. 
You're going to repeat your primary assessment and reassess the patient's vital signs. If they are critical, we reassess every five minutes. And if they're not critical, we can reassess every 10 to 15 minutes. Reassess their chief complaint because as burns go along, they can change. Okay. Uh, Reevaluate and, and I don't mean that the burn itself will change, but the chief complaint may change. Um, maybe they're starting to get hoarse in that airway. Maybe they're feeling some extra swelling in the in the airway. Okay, so we want to continually reassess their chief complaint. Uh, Reevaluate any interventions that you have done. So you stopped the burning process. How is that? Is that you know still uh, ongoing? Assess and treat breathing. Support their circulation. Uh, rapid transport. Provide that oxygen. Uh, and if your patient has signs of hypoperfusion or signs of shock, you're going to want to treat them aggressively and provide rapid transport. Now, as a BLS crew, again, you're going to want to keep your patient warm. You're going to um, want to, uh, you know, treat for shock clicks and then rapid transport. Okay. That is what you're going to do. Rapid transport to an ALS squad. If an ALS squad gets there, obviously start those IVs, get some uh, fluids, and you guys can use the Parkland formula. I'm not going to go through that tonight. This is just a very basic overview of burns, um, but you can use the Parkland formula to, uh, you know, treat your patients with fluid resuscitation. Um, fluid resuscitation. Communication and documentation, you're going to want to provide the hospital personnel with a uh, description of how the burn occurred, uh, the extent of that burn, the amount of body surface area that is burned, uh, again, the depth of the burn, location of the burn, if any special areas were involved, again, that face, the airway, the hands, the feet, the genitals, they're going to want to know this information. All right, so again, our first responsibility in caring for our patient with a burn is to stop that burning process and then prevent any additional injury. So let's talk about some specific burns, okay? Uh, you are thermal burns. They are caused by heat. Most commonly, they are caused by skulls or an open flame. Uh, the flame burn is very often a deep burn, especially if a person's clothing catches fire. A skull burn is most commonly seen in those children and handicapped adults, but it can happen to anyone, particularly particularly while cooking. So, um, or coming in contact with hot objects can produce a contact burn. Now, contact burns are rarely deep, unless the patient was, for whatever reason, pre, uh, prevented from actually drawing away from that hot hot object. Uh, you can see a steam burn, which can produce a topical burn, which look, look like a scald burn. Your minor steam burns are common when microwaving food covered with plastic wrap, right? You take that food out of the microwave, you take the plastic wrap off, and all of a sudden you get this steam burn into your face. Or who has opened up the um, the popcorn bag, right? And you burnt your little fingers because that steam came out and your fingers were right there. Uh, a flash burn is produced by an explosion, which may briefly expose a person to some very intense heat. And then your lightning strikes can also cause a flash burn. So you see some blistering on that top picture, some blistering on your bottom picture. So we know that we have some second degree burns going on here. So your management of a thermal burn, we're going to stop the burning source, cool the burn area if it's appropriate, and remove all jewelry. So if your hand has got the burn on it, we want to remove jewelry because our hand is going to start swelling up. Okay, we don't want that jewelry to get stuck on there. You want to maintain a high index of suspicion for any inhalation injury. Uh, an increased exposure time is going to increase damage to that patient. The larger the burn, the more likely the patient is going to be susceptible to that hypothermia and or hypovolemia. So make sure that we are keeping our patients warm with blankets and that cabin temperature. And all patients with large surface burns should have a dry, sterile dressing applied to them. Your inhalation burns, uh, these injuries can occur when burning takes place in enclosed spaces without good ventilation. 
Upper airway damage is often associated with the inhalation of a superheated gases. Lower airway damage is often associated with the inhalation of your chemicals and or particulate matter. When treating a patient for inhalation injuries, you're gonna to want to encounter, uh, you may encounter severe upper airway swelling, which requires immediate intervention. So again, consider requesting ALS backup if the patient has any signs or symptoms of edema, if you hear strider or hoarseness in their voice, if they have those singed nasal hairs, uh, any burns to the face at all, um, carbon particles in the sputum, okay? If they're spitting up in its dark color. If you can apply cool mist aerosol therapy um, or humidified oxygen to help reduce some of the minor edema that you can see with this. Um, and then also think of potentially carbon monoxide intoxication or carbon monoxide poisoning for oh, um, also with an inhalation burn because again, in that enclosed space, okay? So, <clears throat> Uh, and remember as well that your patients with severe uh, carbon monoxide poisoning usually are going to have a normal oxygen saturation. So don't use that, you know, uh, as your go-to that they have uh, an oxygen saturation of 98%. So they still need oxygen therapy. Uh, potentially, you could see some hydrogen cyanide, which is generated by the combustion. Uh, so, and signs and symptoms of this are going to involve the central nervous system, the respiratory system, and the cardiovascular system. So, you could potentially see some faintness or anxiety, abnormal vital signs. They may experience a headache. Maybe they have a seizure or even paralysis and coma. So to manage these inhalation burns, uh, again, your safety is of utmost important first, then your, your coworkers, the bystanders around you, and then your patient, right? So apply oxygen uh, and rapid transport. Your chemical burns. Now these guys can occur whenever a toxic substance contacts the body. So most chemical burns, again, are caused by those strong acids or a strong alkali. Your eyes can be particularly vulnerable. The severity of the burn is going to be directly related to three factors. So the type of chemical that's involved, the concentration of that chemical, and how long were they exposed to it. So to prevent exposure to hazardous materials, determine if you can safely approach the patient. Again, your safety is first. In some cases, you will have to wait for a hazmat team um, to actually come on scene and de decontaminate that patient before you actually make contact with them. You're going to want to wear appropriate chemical resistant gloves and eye protection whenever you are caring for a patient who has a chemical burn. To treat these, um, so the severity of the burn is going to depend on the type of chemical, its strength duration, and its, um, and again, the body that's been exposed. So we need to stop the burning process, so remove any chemical from the patient. If the chemical is dry, we're going to want to brush it off of the skin and clothing before we start flushing the patient with any water. We want to remove the patient's clothing, including their shoes, stockings, gloves, and any jewelry or eyeglasses. Uh, take great care to ensure that you do not come in contact with that chemical. And the patient should be properly decontaminated by properly trained personnel. Um, Journey, are you still on the call with us? Yeah, I am. Could you, if, could you <laughs> tell your story of the gentleman uh, who ended up with a severe burn to his leg and how that happened? Oh yeah, so a lime truck driver that was hauling lime between plants and throughout the day he had thought uh, that he just had like a bug bite or something on his leg, middle of summer. And of course he's handling chemicals. So he's wearing chemical suits, proper stuff that he's supposed to be wearing when handling lime dust and uh, by the end of the day, so he said the itching started probably like an hour after his shift started. Um, he works uh, 12 to 18 hour shifts. Uh, and by the end of his shift, he then had finally like picked up his pants leg uh, to see why it was itching so bad near his ankle. And he actually had a hole, a burn uh, down to the bone from the lime dust that his sweat 
had uh, reacted with the lime dust, causing it to start corroding the skin. And he thought he was just like a bug bite and he kept itching it and itching it, spreading it, making it worse. Uh, and it was just lime dust must have gotten in between his sock and his leg because uh, he didn't have the appropriate shoes on or boots on to protect his legs from it. And with the wetness from the sweat and the lime dust, it started, you know, eroding his skin away. He had to be yeah. seen at the hospital. He's going to probably have a permanent divot there now <laughs> right and you said you could see all the way down to his bone yeah it had yeah. he i don't know how it wasn't more painful than that but he said right. it was just like no more than an itch and finally he went down to itch further and it felt weird which then caused him to look and then obviously once he saw it he kind of freaked out a little bit because he had sure. a hole down sure. to his ankle but all right well thank you for sharing so um, if the chemical is liquid, we want to immediately begin to flush the burn area with large amounts of water, uh, actually flood the area, you know, uh, for about 15 to 20 minutes, uh, even after the patient says the burning pain has stopped, we want to still flood the area with water. If the patient's eyes has been burned, we want to hold the eyelid open uh, without applying any pressure actually to the globe of the eye and flood the eye with a gentle stream of water. So, and as with any substance, once the fluid has been contaminated with the chemical, collect it and properly dispose of it. Okay. An electrical burn. So it can be a result of contact with high or low voltage electricity. High voltage burns may occur when utility workers make direct contact with power lines. Uh, ordinary household currents can cause severe burns and can cause cardiac arrhythmias, uh, even lethal cardiac arrhythmias, okay? So for electricity to flow, there has to be a complete circuit between the electrical source and the ground. So any substance that prevents this circuit from being completed is called an insulator. And any substance that allows the current to flow through it is a conductor. And the human body is a great conductor. Electrical burns occur when the body or part of it completes a circuit, uh, connecting a power source to the ground. So this type of electrical current um, or magnitude of current and voltage is going to have an effect on the seriousness of the burn. Uh, two dangers specifically associated with electrical burns are they may there may be a large amount of deep tissue injury, and the patient can go into cardiac or respiratory arrest from that electrical shock. So um, again, it can throw um, you know, our our heart has electricity through it, so it can throw the, our electrical rhythm off and potentially cause that lethal rhythm. So. Defibrillation is utmost important on um, on these patients. Make sure that you're attaching your AED and if they're unresponsive and check them out. So electrical current can cause the, well, I already talked about that. Okay, let's move on. So if indicated, we we're gonna want to begin CPR on the patient. Um, and obviously, you know, do your, your ACLS protocols from BLS all the way up to your critical care paramedic, paramedics, okay? Uh, defibrillate if necessary, give oxygen, uh, treat the soft tissue injury by applying dry, soft, dry sterile dressing on all burn, burn wounds and splinting any suspected fractures. And again, provide prompt transport unless you're doing CPR. We're not transporting if we're doing CPR. Taser injury can be an electrical injury as well. Um, this is where you have the two small darts or electrodes that puncture the patient's skin. Uh, and the barbs are generally treated as impaled objects and removed by a physician, but there are some protocols out there where EMS are allowed to remove these barbs from patients. So go um, you know, along with your local protocols uh, if you are able to do that or not. Okay, a lot of times the people who are getting tased by law enforcement, uh, these patients could have like excited delirium. Um, and sometimes they could have uh, illegal drug ingestion as well. So even excited delirium on its own is a true emergency 
So we're going to want our ALS units on board with us. But if we have that going on and now we have uh, taser activated as well, um, we could, again, have some, any, some dysrhythmias and sudden cardiac arrest from that. So, so if you are going into somebody who has been tased by an officer, um, make sure, you know, that you're thinking of, you know, have use of an AED as well on these patients if they're unresponsive. Okay, four more slides and then we're out of here. Okay, I know I'm, we're coming up on our time here. So radiation burn. Uh, potential threats include incidences that are related to the use and transportation of radioactive isotopes and intentionally, because it happens, intentionally released radioactivity from a terrorist attack. So we wanna first determine if there has been a radiation exposure and then attempt to determine whether ongoing exposure is still existing. Um, <clears throat> so there's three types of ionizing radiation. So your first one is the alpha. These have little penetrating energy and it's easily stopped by the skin. Your next one is beta. Beta particles have greater penetrating power. They can travel much farther in air than an alpha particle can. It can penetrate the skin, but it's usually blocked by simple protective clothing. Uh, and then you also have your gamma particles. So the threat from gamma radiation is directly proportional to its own wavelength. So it penetrates, ease, it easily passes through the body and solid materials. Um, most ionizing radiation accidents involve gamma radiation or an X-ray. So people who have sustained a radiation exposure generally do not pose a risk to others, but in incidences involving explosions, patients can be contaminated. So to manage the radiation burn, you want to maintain a safe distance, wait for the hazmat team to decontaminate the patient before initiating any care. Most of the contaminants can be removed by simply removing the patient's clothes. Uh, once there is no more, no longer a threat to you, you can begin treating with XABC. So X, of course, being bleeding. So control bleeding, A, and then their ABCs. Treat the patient for any burns or trauma. Irrigate any open wounds. Notify the emergency department that there's been uh, radiation exposure. Okay, and you want to limit your duration of any exposure as well. All right. Real quick, let's see if you guys were paying attention. Which of the following is considered a severe burn? Uh, both of them. So D, D, 5% full thickness burn with a fracture. That would be correct. All right. Okay, a five-year-old boy was burned when he pulled a barbecue grill over on himself. He has partial and full thickness burns to his anterior chest and circumferentially on both arms. What percentage of his body surface area has been burned? 36. C. Does everybody agree with C? E. So his anterior, so five-year-olds, we're looking at the middle. So anterior chest, we have 18. Both of his mm -hmm. arms, so nine and nine. Six. We all agree? See? I see a bunch of Cs. Mm -hmm. All right. And finally, which of the following statements regarding chemical burns is false? C is false. C is false. Do you all agree? Yeah. I yes. do too. Okay. All right. And if you guys don't have any other questions, you are welcome to hop off and continue on with your night. Thank, Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for popping on. I appreciate it. Good night. 
Every month, we offer free live CE courses for Michigan and NREMTEMS personnel. Participants will only be awarded CEs if they attend the live class. To learn more, send us a direct message, leave a comment, or join our Facebook group. We sincerely appreciate your interest and support. Thank you.